Today on the program, Lamar Waldron and I do a deep dive into the connections between Bill Barr, Martin Luther King's murder, and the cover-up of MLK's murder and Bill Barr's current and 1992 cover-ups of Republican crimes. Check it out. Ding the bell, leave your comments, and subscribe to our channel. I want to start out uh, with my old buddy, Lamar Waldron. Lamar and I uh, have written a couple of books together, including uh, All About Sacrifice and Legacy of Secrecy. Uh, a book that contains about 100 pages of uh, Martin Luther King's murder. Today is the tragic 21st anniversary of the murder, the assassination in, Mar in uh, Memphis of Martin Luther King, uh, Jr., the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And uh, you've heard us talk about this as well as a new law that might get some of these files released. Um, so anyhow, with us is uh, Lamar Waldron, uh, his uh, yeah, most recent books, well, Legacy of Secrecy, The Long Shadow of the JFK Assassination, uh, Lamar, we've got to update your information here. I don't have your, I don't have either of your most recent books on my one sheet. I'm sorry. The most recent two books are Watergate: The Hidden History, as well as The Hidden History of the JFK Assassination. That's only 500 some odd pages. So unlike the 900 plus page Legacy of Secrecy, it's a, it's a relatively quick read. Right. So today is the 51st anniversary of the assassination of John, of, of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, who killed King and why? Well, basically, as you and I have talked before, um, it was uh, a, a group of, of at least um, uh, four men here in Atlanta who were raising money for years um, for the purpose of killing King. And uh, they were actually spending that money buying undeveloped mountain land just over the Georgia border into North Carolina. And, but eventually, after several years, they were collecting the money at one of the plants in Atlanta that had the highest paid workers, a General Motors plant on the south side. And these were highly paid union workers. And I've worked at that plant later, so I can attest to that. And, um, you know, and most of those people are great guys, but, you know, a total, uh, at, at, at peak, 7,000 people worked uh, three shifts. So, you know, if even a small number of those are giving five or four dollars a week to these guys, that's a lot of money. But as the years went by and and there were there were really no attempts against King that they could claim credit for, some of his contributors got angry. And so um, eventually they, 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 they started trying to recruit locally, were unsuccessful there. Uh, congressional investigators found out about that plot only you know, 20 years later, and so eventually they turned one of the one of the four men from South Georgia, a, a longtime professional white supremacist named Joseph Miltier. He had been involved on the periphery of JFK's assassination. In fact, talked about it on Miami police informant tape, JFK's murder, uh, two weeks before JFK was killed, and he was very accurate. And this is all on tape; you can find it on the internet and stuff. But at the same time, he was telling an informant who was working for the Miami police, that, um, that they were also plotting to kill King. This is all the way back in 63. So we're flashing ahead now to 1968, late 1967. Miltier goes back to the architect of the JFK assassination, the self-confessed guy who had JFK killed, along with his associates, the godfather of Louisiana and parts of Mississippi and lots of Texas, Carlos Marcello. And so... You know, Miltier was connected with J.B. Stone or the Klan, all these different white supremacist groups, but, you know, he knew that could be traced back. Who knew who was an FBI informant? So if you went to Marcello, who did not take the contract at all, didn't take the contract, he brokered the deal out to one of his underlings. Okay. And so James Orr Ray, who had broken out of prison in the uh, uh, spring of 1967, um, and then traveled all over the country. I mean, from breaks out of prison like Missouri, goes to Illinois, to Canada, to Alabama, to Mexico, to Los Angeles, back to New Orleans, back to Los Angeles, back to New Orleans. I mean, then to, I mean, just. But but he was a, a low-level courier in Marcello's uh, vast drug network that Marcello shared with other Godfathers. And so um, um, Ray winds up being part of this arrangement, whether as a spotter or an actual shooter, we don't know, because as you'll hear shortly, there were two different roles. And so uh, these people basically put up the money to have 
King killed in Memphis. And, and it was simply racism and money, two things that drive a lot of politics today, that basically resulted in having Martin Luther King killed. Um, but as we're going to talk shortly, there's a lot of new information that, that people have been digging up, uh, two researchers, authors especially, that, that go beyond anything you and I have ever talked about on the air before. Yeah, well, and, and, and in fact, in the, in the second half hour of our conversation, we're even going to get into, uh, you know, William Barr, and, and not that he was directly involved with the King assassination, but his roles in cover-ups and uh, attorney uh, Republican. And, and, and his cover-up roles, as we'll talk about in the next half hour, do to touch on the King assassination. Yes, absolutely. Um, what are the most, uh, first of all, what new information do you have? How did you get it? And what are the most important King assassination files that are being still kept secret? Well, the, the new information is basically a lot of extensive corroboration and expansion for what you and I were writing about back in 2008 in Legacy of Secrecy. You know, so we put the information out there. It's in a book. We talked about it, you know, in public and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, I would go on CNN and places, and we talked about it a lot on your show, and other people were like, huh, let me dig into that. Let me see what I can turn up. Mm -hmm. and, and lo and behold, uh, two researchers in particular, Stuart Wexler and uh, Larry Hancock, who were a big help to us on the JFK side of things, uh, they've now written their, they uh, came out just last year, their second book on the King murder, and they found some really incredible corroboration for what you and I turned up. The, the, the General Motors plant, where uh, Miltier and his three associates, one of whom worked at the plant, uh, was across the street from the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. Okay? So if you're trying to find someone to kill King, even before you reach out to Carlos Marcello, the, 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 you know, the powerful godfather of New Orleans, you might look across the street, because across the street from the General Motors plant was the Atlanta Federal Pen. Well, it turns out the FBI has had a record in their files for decades saying that a guard at the Atlanta Federal Pen was aware that three businessmen from Atlanta were meeting with uh, inmates at the Atlanta Federal Pen offering a contract to kill Martin Luther King. This is an FBI Whoa. that Wexler and Hancock turned out. So, in other words, you know, it's literally across the street from this place, you know, because they're going to be looking, hey, we need to get a criminal. Hey, here's the federal pin. But get this, uh, what they have dug up goes even farther. <coughs> Excuse me. Because what, what they also found out was that, that various racist groups, in particular around Atlanta, North Carolina, in southern Mississippi had been trying to kill King since at least 1963 by offering a bounty. The problem was the Klan groups, even the powerful white knights of the, of the Ku Klux Klan in southern Mississippi, the most violent Klan group in the country who was involved with killing the three civil rights workers and all that kind of stuff, um, they didn't have the money that would be required because, you know, you don't pay the hitman directly. You go to a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy, right. and all these people know if you, if you blab, you die, which is why they wanted an ex-con, because an ex-con would know they're not even safe in prison, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, it turns out that, that the FBI has been, has been sitting on for decades tons of reports. I, I, I think at last count, at least seven or eight different reports from different people at different times about this bounty that was being offered. And when Ray, who was just a petty criminal who never, like, like killed anybody, uh, in his prison, uh, one of, of his fellow inmates who knew Ray, Ray well said, oh, yeah, we heard about that bounty there. In fact, James Earl Ray knew about that bounty. So between finding these FBI files that this, that this bounty you know, with this, and it was a hundred thousand dollars by the time we get to Ray. But of course, he's not getting that. You know, and back money, then, a hundred grand was like you know six, seven hundred thousand now. Exactly. I mean, it was just exactly. a massive amount of money. But but between getting those FBI files and then and then tracking down people and relatives who were in there, they even tracked down the guy who had who had been recently released from prison on parole in Atlanta, who took some of the money from Atlanta to. Mar Marcello's territory and, and the south of, of uh, and the lower half of, of Mississippi. So it's just amazing stuff. Now, for whatever reason, they didn't go into much detail at all on Carlos Marcello. You know, when you and I have written a lot about that, I, I took their information and then I have been turned up 
more information that, that again, brings us back to Carlos Marcello, back to the mafia, back to the fact that James or Ray's family, going back to Ray's grandmother, you know, we think of grandmothers as grandmothers, right? James or Ray's grandmother was a mafia courier who carried money Whoa. between between the Missouri Mafia and the Chicago Mafia. So and, it's like, you know, the, the uh, and, 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 you know, we lay this out in our book, uh, uh, Legacy of Secrecy, but basically the mob killed Jack Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. And and it, it's the saddest thing in the world, but, but yeah, you're right. And, and, and when we get close to, to Bobby Kennedy's assassination uh, anniversary, that tragic day in June, um, we'll talk, you know, the bounties were actually kind of similar. It goes beyond that. Sirhan Sirhan always wanted a white Mustang. That's what he felt like, even a guy short in stature like him and low of social status, because he was an aspiring jockey who couldn't quite hack it. Uh, you know, he was a little guy, basically. But if he had a white Mustang, boy, he'd get the girls then, right? Uh, well, in Los Angeles, at the same time as Sirhan Sirhan, and at the same time Sirhan Sirhan was, was looking at self-hypnosis, was James Earl Ray looking at self-hypnosis to help him do something he'd never done. And James Earl Ray was driving a white Mustang when he killed Martin Luther King. Whoa. So, Lamar, uh, tell us about this, this new law, that uh, the Civil Rights Cold Case Records Collection Act of 2017. Uh, it sounds very boring, uh, but uh, actually it might be a big deal. Tell us about this. Well, it, it, it's a pretty big deal because, again, people don't realize two big things. One, most people don't realize that the, that the U.S. Congress actually did an extensive investigation on Martin Luther King, as well as JFK's assassinations, in the late 1970s, and concluded in each case that a conspiracy was involved. Right. In JFK's case, they pointed the finger at Carlos Marcello and his associate in, in Tampa, Florida godfather, uh, Sandro Traficanti. In King's case, they, they concluded basically that Ray acted for money, but they they didn't really, you know, try to point fingers because they actually ran those two investigations very separately. They almost never crossed over except for one trip Ray made through New Orleans. So, but the pro, but, but so uh, we have a lot that the House Select Committee on Assassinations, that was the name of both committees, they had the JFK branch and the King branch. We, we have, they, they did a report, they did supporting volumes, and they, they also had their, their, their raw papers, their raw investigation stuff. We have the raw investigation stuff, 99.9% .9 of it, for the, King, for the JFK's assassination. For the King assassination, we have their re report. We have the supporting volumes. But we have almost zero of their supporting, um, their actual files and investigations and their dead ends, whereas we have hundreds of thousands of that committee's JFK files, we have basically zero of their King files. But, but it's worse than that. The, the FBI is sitting on tons of files about Carlos Marcello and the two most important files about Joseph Miltier, that, that white racist. The very first report the FBI ever did on Miltier before JFK was killed, after he'd been picked up on that, that you know, from the informant and the, and the, and the wiretap, um, I even talked to the FBI agent who went down to Quitman, Georgia, way south Georgia, investigated him, drove that report back up to Atlanta, gave it to the, the Atlanta FBI office. It never appeared. And the FBI, hmm. after King was killed, they investigated Stoner, all these big racists to see, well, where were these racists when King was killed, right? We have nothing that they ever looked in to Miltier at all, even though they only closed their file on Miltier and JFK the year before. So... And, and then on Carlos Marcello, I turned up the file with the first published legacy of secrecy that says Marcello brokered a contract on, on killing King to, you know, at the, at, in, in, in 68, you know, for a bunch of white supremacists. Right. Uh, the, it's unclear if, if FBI gave that record to the congressional committee. There's a lot of supporting material in that report that we don't have, even the Atlanta FBI office's field office filed for the King assassination was, quote-unquote, damaged in a flood. So even though the HSCA, the House Select Committee, was shown that, we don't have that file today. There's just so much information that we don't have. So what, what, what did a bunch of high school students in New Jersey do when, when they had history teachers that told them about this? They said, we need to change this. We need a law that will get these Martin Luther King assassination records released, 
and like something out of an old Frank Capra movie, they wrote the law, they lobbied Congress, and, and Trump just signed it just this past January. The Civil Rights Cold Case Records Collection Act of 2017 is now in the hands of Congress to appropriate, Trump to appoint a special board, and Barr to cooperate with it. Lamar, uh, we were just talking about this new law, the Civil Rights Cold Case uh, Records Collection Act of 2017 that just got, literally just got passed. It, it is the law now. Congress can appropriate funds and uh, Trump and Attorney General Barr then can start releasing some of these old files, some of which you've found, some of these FBI files and things. Well, here, 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 here's what has to happen. Okay, so, so first off, the law got passed and, and was signed by Trump, and it, and it is modeled on the 1992 JFK Act that got four and a half million pages of files released. Now, that, that act did not get all the files released, and, and you and I talk about those remaining files off and on. So, you know, that act was great, but it wasn't perfect. And, and I, I have an inside view, because as, as you know, and I've mentioned in the book, I was a confidential, confidential informant for the JFK Records Review Board in the 1990s because they could get records more easily than I could, right? right. So, um, so, so he, here are the steps that need to go to, and here's what your listeners can do. So number one, first off, everyone should call their members of Congress and say, you need to appropriate the money for this law you passed. So the law has been signed, it's in effect, but it needs an appropriation. That's step one. All right, the Civil Rights Records Act, we can right, call the it. Civil, yeah. The Civil Rights Records Act. Civil Rights, actually, the official name is the Civil Rights Cold Case Records Act. Right. Okay. That needs that needs to be appropriate, and every every listener has as you know a member of Congress and a and two senators. So everyone needs right. to push that. Next thing is Trump uh, has to appoint the uh, this uh, a review board of distinguished people that are supposed to be recommended by the American Bar Association, American Historical Association. You know, these are supposed to be like really distinguished. You know, non -political. right. So, so let's get them out there and let's get this thing going. Um, right. Well, I, well but, but then, then the last thing is, is that is that the Justice Department. This is only for federal records, so it's all going to come back to the Justice Department, which puts it squarely in the hands of William Barr. Yeah, and we'll get to that in more detail in the next hour. Uh, we just have a minute here in, in this half hour, Lamar. Is you know you've been talking about the way that the FBI uh, was uh, uh, committing malpractice, basically, with regard to both the uh, Kennedy and King assassinations, both the Kennedy assassinations. Um, to what extent is that still going on, particularly as as it as it relates to civil rights? So, for example, the, the protesters in Ferguson, or you know other other people protesting violations of of civil rights around well, the country. Well, I, I think of course it's still going on. A again, you know the the FBI is more diverse than it used to be, but they still have a lot of problems. I mean, James Comey not only helped to get Trump elected, even though, of course, Putin did most of the work, but, you know, diversity in the FBI did not improve. That has to change. You know, most people in the FBI are great people, dedicated, hardworking, but you have, like, this, this old entrenched bureaucracy, like all those, those FBI people up in New York, who just aren't with the program, and they're about protecting secrets not prosecuting, and, and, and I'll leave it at this, you know, there, there could be two people of those four who could still be prosecuted. I do not know if they're still alive or not. Of which four? Of the, of the four people who were collecting the money at the GM plant. Miltier got blown up in an accident in the early 70s. Hugh Spake is inside man at the plant, whom James O'Reilly called after King's assassination when he came back to Atlanta. Um, Spake died. Uh, not all that long ago, less than a mile from my house. But, but there was a dentist and an attorney who were kind of the big money men. And as far as we know, they were never even interviewed. Wow. So there could even, you know, so Hugh Spake had been prosecuted until I think it was 2009. And there could still be an elderly person who, if, even if you don't want to put those people in prison, and I do, 